If you're new here, my name is Matt, and I'm a full-time electrical engineer making this goblin game, where you play as a goblin whose island is being invaded by nasty humans. It's a sandbox game where you explore the island for resources, fight bosses, build up your town, and befriend the NPCs, and do all the standard RPG stuff like farming and fishing and livestock and whatever. Overall, I usually describe it as a blend between Stardew Valley and Terraria, if you've played either of those. The game is of course multiplayer with up to eight friends, and my goal is to just make something that's fun to play alone or with your pals. Now today I wanted to show you some of the new stuff in the game, but I also wanted to show you what an average day looks like for me since I'm a busy little goblin boy, and how I actually make any progress on this thing while slaving away at my full-time job, so stay tuned for that. But the first thing I did was add a new sub-biome. Welcome to the mushroom forest biome, full of giant mushrooms and these little mushroom people. This biome will be particularly wild and untamed. The humans have struggled to expand deep into it due to the warlike mushroom folk, who generally keep to themselves but will attack you if you trespass. I wanted to make you feel like a bad person for bothering these native mushroom people, so I made it so the exploding mushroom enemy sheds a single tear before making his noble sacrifice for his brethren. He does, after all, have a family, you monster. If you go deep enough, you'll encounter the Mush Mother. Clicking on her starts a swarm, where she'll summon plenty of her mushroom babies to defend her. Defeating all of her minions causes her to explode, and you get a mysterious reward. And with that, I of course added a bunch of mushroom furniture and a mushroom hat. But nobody wants to waste an armor slot on something that just looks nice. So I added vanity armor slots where you can place stuff that looks nice but isn't very useful, and it'll visually override the actual armor that you're wearing. Pretty standard for games like this. After all that was done, I took a couple weeks and added anime mode to the game. That's right, you can now change the language to any of these languages in the settings menu and it'll pull the correct translation from these magic spreadsheets I have. Basically, I type any text I need here in my game engine and it populates it into this spreadsheet. I then paste in the translations and put the spreadsheet back into the game, and the game displays the correct text depending on what language you choose. Right now, it's Google translated nonsense garbage. I only took two years of Spanish, but I'm pretty sure that's not right. But eventually I'll send these spreadsheets to real translators to get them to fill it out. Now, you may be wondering why I did this when the game isn't even done yet. The problem is, I was making all of these menus, but I was baking them in English, so when the game is done, I'd have to go back and change all of them. Since I've implemented it now though, I can prep things as I go, wasting less time in the long run. Now once translation was done, I added a new boss. We already have the Huntress, who's a druid, and the Bard, who's, well, a bard. Now we have the Barbarian and Cleric duo, forming the third and fourth members of the party of attacking human villains. As the fight begins, the Cleric grows the Barbarian with magic and he slams you with his massive fists while she flies around annoyingly shooting you and healing him. It needs some tweaking, it isn't incredibly fun yet, but we'll get there eventually. I'm leaving it alone for a few weeks so it can fester as a moldy stain in the back of my mind until I come back to it later. In the meantime, I've gone ahead and done something that's been on my list for a while now. I need to make it so you can find your lost or captured goblin friends out in the wild. I already have NPCs that arrive in town and go about their daily schedules, they can be given gifts and can follow you around on walks. Different goblins will come to your town when certain requirements are met. Clang, the blacksmith for example, will arrive when he hears you first use the anvil. The problem is, they currently can only come to you. It isn't possible yet to save them. So I dove into fixing that. One fear I had though was that if I just pre-place them somewhere on the map, the player may scrounge every square into the map and not find them until they check the last little spot where they were the whole time. This could get really annoying if you're unlucky, so I instead made it so that they'll spawn in a few places, and then when you come across one for the first time, the others will disappear. This way, the player feels luckier than they actually are. Here you can see I can walk up to this captured goblin, kill his captors, free him, and he'll tell me that he'll meet me at the beacon in town. A few hours later, he shows up there asking me to make a house for him. Now the next thing I did was a distracting excuse to not work on the things that I should be working on. Sometimes I just need to add stuff that looks pretty to keep me motivated, even though it may not be the most strategic use of my time. I added these little cloud shadows that float around during the day. It's super small and dumb, but I like how it makes the game feel just a bit more alive. I also added these fog particles at night that fade in and out, making it look ominous and foggy. Both of these are just particles that float around using Unity's particle system. Nothing super difficult, so it only took me a few hours. I then needed a way for NPCs to express that they want things in their houses. Right now, each goblin shows up at the green beacon asking for a house. You have to make a house and put a bed in it and then you can assign them to it, but I don't want them living in little pathetic prison cells. I want them to be able to ask the player for stuff. Fig, the farmer who's obsessed with mushrooms for example, will likely want some mushroom furniture, but how do I get her to ask for it? I considered maybe a town request board where they can post their requests, or perhaps they send you letters, but ultimately I decided on diaries. You could put a diary in the home of any goblin and then they'll write in it, expressing their deepest desires. They can write about furniture they want in their house, or they can wish for their house to be clean closer to a river, or they can say that they want to be closer or further from a goblin neighbor that they like or hate. You can sneak in and take a peek at their diary and give them what they want, resulting in gifts and more friendship. I think sneaking in and reading journals is a bit more goblin-y than a town message board. Now speaking of writing down your desires, my video layout template is telling me that it's time to show for interaction, so feel free to write down your desires and secrets in the comments section.
description. Maybe somebody will read them and fulfill them to gain friendship and gifts from you, who knows. And if you're too shy or lazy to write a comment, smashing the like button goes a long way to making YouTube show the game to more people, so if you do that, I'll think about you fondly as I drift off to sleep each night. But yeah, once that was done, I needed some way for your inventory space to go from small to large, but I didn't want the player to just buy a bigger bag or something. I wanted it to be flavored in a more fun way. I ended up making it so, from the start of the game, you have some nasty varmints in your inventory. Throughout the duration of the game, you just have to deal with them being there. But eventually you'll research fancy varmint repellent that makes them leave your inventory and become pets instead. I already had a research system all done, so this was pretty easy to do. Now you may recall that human chests contain human gizmos, which can be put in your pockets of your armor and give you cool abilities, like glowing in the dark or letting you go in hot areas without damage or whatever. These items are confusing to a goblin, and need to be appraised by the goblin named Gizmo in town, who is an expert in such matters. He of course acts like an expert, but completely misinterprets the function of the most basic human items, but that's just my super original funny idea that came completely from my own brain and nowhere else at all. Well, I've added a ton of them. As some examples, you've got this innovative human arrowhead that increases range damage, or this sacred holy orb that's so heavy that it reduces your knockback, and so on. Along a similar vein, I added some crops, and with them, potions. These crops will be scattered around the island here and there, and eventually you'll be able to buy seeds from the farming NPC. Coming up with crops is a bit hard. I usually try to think of a buff that I want, like say glowing in the dark, and work my way backwards to a crop that serves that function, like a glowing mushroom. This way every crop has a purpose, and I don't make anything useless and waste time. Just like how it's kinda easier to make a joke by starting with the punchline, I find I need to make items by focusing on their end goals, but I guess that's kinda obvious now that I say it. Now speaking of wasting time, I previously had a stamina mechanic in the game where every time you rolled you'd lose some stamina, and if you rolled too many times you wouldn't be able to roll anymore for a bit until it recharged. Kinda like Monster Hunter. I decided I didn't like this very much. Monster Hunter pulls this off since positioning is a huge part of the combat, you need to rely less on last minute dodges and more on knowing the enemy moves so well that you're in the right place already. If you're dodging to the point where you're running out of stamina constantly, you're probably doing something wrong. In this game however, I'm going for a combat that's closer to a blend between Hades and Enter the Gungeon, where dodging is pretty frequent and important. I've made it so you can dodge to your heart's content, but there's a bit of a delay after you land until you can dodge again. There are of course gizmos that allow double or triple dodges or speed up the dodge, but that's how it'll be. Now as promised, it's time to cover what a typical day looks like for me and show how I make progress on the game. Well, I usually wake up each day at 8.30 and drive on over to work. I like listening to not another D&D podcast while I drive, but I've lately been taking a break and listening to the Andy Serkis narrated Lord of the Rings audiobooks. It's been a while since I read them, so I'm enjoying it a lot. I'll then work from 9 to 5-ish. My work is usually me writing documents, testing some components, or designing some new circuits. Nothing too mentally taxing. I spend most of the day there alone since I'm one of only two electrical engineers at the company, but my boss usually checks in once a day. Once work is done, I get home at like 5.15. I'll then eat my one big meal for the day while watching anime or something. And at 6, I do my 30-ish minutes of violin practice. I've been taking violin lessons for about a year and a half now, but I still kind of sound like garbage. I don't think I'll show a clip here, but you might be able to convince me to send one in the Discord channel. Just be warned, it's, uh, not, it's really not great. I then take a shower and work from 7pm until midnight, and go directly to sleep to get ready for the next day. Sometimes I'll have something planned with friends or we'll spontaneously play games, but I'm usually working all night. On weekends, I usually try to get about 10 hours of work done each day on the game, but that rarely happens these days. Usually one of the weekend days gets consumed by some sort of event, or spending time with my friends or girlfriend, or driving two hours back to San Diego to see my family. I also sometimes get super into playing a game and just hardly get any work done, but that usually only lasts a week or so and then I'm back on the wagon. So ultimately I get maybe 33 to 40 hours of progress done on the game in an average week, which is about the same amount of time as a full-time job, so it's a huge time commitment, but we'll see if it pays off. Now speaking of it paying off, I want to, as usual, show my wishlist count for the game this month to be transparent. Wishlists on Steam are a great way of estimating future sales and gauging general interest. They say 10 to 20,000 wishlists is kind of the bare minimum to maybe succeed, so I'm currently aiming for about 50,000 to be safe. As I record this audio, I'm at about 23.6 thousand, but it may have gone up a tiny bit by the time I get my screenshot. We're almost halfway to the goal that I thought would be completely impossible, and I couldn't be more excited about it. Honestly, I just really hope I can live up to the expectations for the game. I've never made something this complex before, so it may take me a while to tweak everything and make it perfect, so bear with me. Just know I won't stop until it's great, and I'll make sure to keep adding to it even after release, even if it's a total flop. Now make sure to do the whole like, comment, subscribe thing to make daddy YouTube algorithm like me. I have it set so every single comment pops up on my phone, and while I can't always respond to them, I do see every single one, so try to make me laugh as I sit in my office board at work. And with that, thanks everyone for watching, and I will see you all next time.
Hello everyone! The time has come to shout out our eternally gracious patrons. I'd like to give a super special shout out to our Goblin Deity patrons for April of 2024, namely Zachary Neese, Zach Fox, Sarah, Charfil, Krakenfall, Brett Hudson, Jackson Singleton, Joseph Scobby, Megan Palmer, Random8408, Reddit Slime on YouTube, Sierra Kovac, Teddy Bear, Enigma77, Snout, Guardian, Chendrak, Player Unnamed, Colton Reagan, and Gilbert Frank. You're all amazing and I appreciate all of the support. 